Hello and welcome to today's 30-second webinar in the E360 webinar series, Why Retrofit Your Supermarket Refrigeration System, brought to you by Emerson. I'm Amanda Rogers and I'm your moderator today. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is provided by phone or through your computer sound system. If you'd like to revisit key sections of today's webinar, it will be on, available on demand at climate.emerson.com slash E360 webinars a few days after this live event. You'll also receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recorded event. Discussing today's topic will be Andre Patnode. Andre is our Director of in Solutions Integration and is responsible for supporting system-related innovation and leveraging Emerson's global cold chain to drive adoption of integrated solutions in North America. He was most recently responsible for food retail marketing growth strategy and has been involved in Emerson's global CO2 development. Andre has more than 35 years of industry experience in sales, marketing, training, and business development of HVACR systems, architectures, and applications with compression and component technology. The webinar will now begin. Andre? Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate it very much. Um, and thanks everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, the topic, as Amanda mentioned, why retrofit your aging supermarket refrigeration architecture is, uh, is something that's been talked about quite a bit these days um, in the press and the news magazine and other forums, and we thought we'd bring it into a webinar format. Um, uh, the slide I've got up here is kind of talks about the dynamics in our industry today and and everything from, from the harvest all the way to the food retailer. And even though Emerson's involved from, from tracking temperatures from the field all the way through the process to the food retailer, uh, some of you may not know that we're also involved in the processing with built or industrial and commercial space, the transportation in, in sea container refrigeration and even over road transportation refrigeration and through the distribution. And, and as we're finding out, today's regulatory environment is causing a lot of uh, stress, uh, but also opportunities for, for many retailers and, uh, and industry participants. And, you know, when you look at this slide, there's a lot of complexity. And as we move to the, to the far right, we're going to focus more today on the food retail and more specifically supermarkets and the opportunities for um, retailers and saving some energy. And when we take a, we, we, we talk about power management, and so why is power management important? There's so many dynamics right now that are going on in the industry. Uh, that's another one. We, we, we've, you've heard a lot about refrigerant regulations um, federally and statewide and even globally for that matter. Well, energy is another one that, that's, that's cropping up, if you will, regionally and having some important considerations on large energy users. So we wanted to have today's conversation around uh, opportunities in this space. Um, so when you look at energy and power, and this chart is an interesting one that talks about, regardless of, of who you are, energy user, but we're using the supermarket as an example here. 12 on the bottom left, or zero, zero on the bottom left corner of this chart really is talking about um, midnight, for example. So at midnight and everything below that top gray line is your energy consumption that happens throughout a 24-hour period. And we understand that at midnight, no one's in the store. It's cooler at night. Energy usage is a bit lower. But as, as the store starts opening, as ambience starts to rise, let's say in a summer day, and people start coming into stores, the doors start opening and closing, as the ambient gets warmer and warmer, you start getting to a specific point of the day, the warmest part of the day, the highest internal activity in the store, where you have a peak kilowatt consumption. And um, really when you're looking at the peak is really that instantaneous energy load. And retailers are dealing with that because all of us have that 
peak period of the day where the energy use is the highest. So when we start talking about energy, it's not all about the consumption in kilowatt hours. It's also how do we mitigate that peak kilowatt period so that we're not penalized at a higher rate in the following year, for example. And those are some of the conversations we're going to have. Um, so depending on where you are in the country, I've, I've picked three, or in North America, for example, I've picked three examples, PG&E out California, Hydro One, which is Ontario in Canada, and then Con Edison in New York. Regardless of the utilities, most of them have some type of different rate structure residentially and commercially. And some of these are called time of use rates that now our retailers are, are having to deal with. There's sometimes there's summer, there are winter uh, rates that typically are two rates, a low rate in the evening, in the overnight, and a mid rate, if you will, during the day. And then there's a, a summer season one that often some of these Utilities may have a low period from midnight to 8.30 or 7.30, depending on where you are. A mid-peak uh, in shoulders between 8.30 and noon, and a higher peak period uh, midday when it's the hottest, when air conditions are running full blast, when refrigeration is running at the highest. And those are three different utility rates. So re retailers are trying to understand how can we try to somehow shift some of that high energy load to areas that are not peak? And are there things that we can do to try to avoid that? And even some of the utilities may have these peak day pricing, not only is there time of use, but certain periods of the year in the, in, in the summer, for example, there's certain days that they will tag that peak period for an end user and carry that high kilowatt rate throughout the fall of the next year. And the reason they do that, of course, is to make sure that we, them as a utility, need to be able to manage all of those peak demands for all of our customers so that the, you know, the way to do that is someone needs to pay for that. Someone needs to pay for the infrastructure to make sure that those peak demands are met so that there's no a variability in the networks. And that costs money in order to do that. So um, interesting report that came from NREL, which is National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, where this report came out and said, hey, there's 18 million commercial users in the U.S. And out of those 18 million commercial users, there's about 5 million of them that are in high utility rate states that the demand charges, those peak demand charges on certain times of the year and certain days can reach as high as $15 per kilowatt. But that's significant. Um, so um, a lot of retailers in those high utility rates is top of mind on how do we uh, keep our energy spend down. Other dynamics really that are also starting to happen in the industry but the rise of renewable and even energy storage, there's a lot of wind, we're hearing about it, a lot of solar um, in order to move away from traditional power generating stations so that it's clean energy, um, so that we can reduce our carbon equivalents, our carbon footprint. And that's a big deal for utilities and, and different parts of the country in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Well, with the rise of renewables comes um, more instability because you're only generating power when there's wind or when there's solar. So the thought of having energy flexibility in large demand uh, uh, sites is interesting and important and top of mind with many retailers because they do have high energy rates. And here's a a slide that was shared to me by John Wallace is from a DOE presentation. It's an example that illustrates a concept of meter coordination. So when you look at the image here, you're looking at solar, you're looking at some wind generation, you're looking at transmission towers, you're looking at traditional power generating plants. And here's a, a scenario that says, 
the ISO communicates that the price, this is number one, top left corner, the ISO communicates that the price is about to increase in a region from 10 cents a kilowatt hour to a dollar a kilowatt hour unless 100 megawatts is removed from the system. So that signal goes out to users that are, that are enabled to read and interpret and act on those signals. So a hotel comes back and says, hey, I'm a hotel, big conference underway. I need maximum cooling for my building. I'm looking to buy additional load reduction to avoid those price increases. Then you got a big box retailer here that, that communicates that hey, I'm a big box store with variable speed fans on my RTUs. I can run those fans somewhat lower speed for 10 minutes and sell you the load reduction. It'll make no noticeable difference to my customer and I can make some money. So they're using their ability to shift load and sell that to someone else. They get paid for it, someone else has a benefit. So the thought around that is if you've got large retailers that have hundreds of locations within a utility district that are all interconnected and tied to the grid and a demand response signal comes out and they have the ability to shift various loads, maybe not the same loads in every store, because every store, every dynamic is different, but ability to shift different areas of the store enough that could return them significant payments from the utilities is something utilities and utility consultants are super interested in working with and understanding and developing, not just them, the DOE, the NRAILs, and so on and so forth. So those are things that need to be thought of as we start seeing more distributed energy, more inconsistent flow, because it's very difficult to store energy unless you have traditional batteries or thermal batteries, there's another way. But other than that, it's to find ways of dynamically shifting. And an enterprise that has all kinds of energy needs from bakeries to HVAC to, to refrigeration um, understanding and lighting, of course, understanding all of those dynamics and, and what you can or can't shift at any given time is becoming super important in leveraging the IoT infrastructure you already have in your facilities and using the information in a better, more informed way. But you need enterprise monitoring in order to be able to do that. You need to be able to pull that data and aggregate that data in a higher level enterprise software, um, so, such like a site supervisor in E2. This particular example is our Connect Plus, Emerson's Connect Plus, where you can, from a, from a Google application, have site of all of your sites across uh, North America, know where they are, and be able to either aggregate that data into a, a, a window or drill down individually. But having that interconnectivity is super important in able to, to, to do higher level um, devices. So let's take a look at a centralized system that we're talking about. Um, centralized DX is probably the most common. Like it is the most common supermarket architecture in North America today. And depending on how many, how much refrigeration you have versus other retail within a given footprint of a store, of course, the refrigeration percentage of that energy will vary. But um, the generally accepted is somewhere around 50 to 70 percent. The HVAC and refrigeration make up the total energy within that space. That's a big number. It's estimated somewhere around $7.7 .7 billion in the uh, supermarket industry. In, in the U.S. And some of the peculiarities about centralized DX, it is the most common architecture, as I mentioned, um, inflexible asset or seemingly inflexible energy asset. And we'll talk about that. We also understand that there's a lot of R22 stores still out there, even though you won't be able to buy Virgin R22 come 2020. And even 404A, is on is uh, in California, for example, you can't use that in new systems already. 
and other U.S. Climate Alliance states are looking at that. So there's pressure on all those higher GWP gases. So it's a good time to look at retrofitting to lower GWP gas and lower your carbon equivalency because this is the architecture that's being targeted globally, if you will, because of leak rates for HFCs. So keep those systems tight and renovate the lower GWP HS uh, options and energy optimize them while you're doing it is the best process to do it. Because a lot of these older systems have a tremendous amount of parasitic losses. And when you look at that, everything from those long liquid lines that can't maintain a subcooled liquid, they get flash gas by the time they get to the valves, cracked insulation, condensing swings, they can't seem to settle out on condensing pressures, everything from excessive compressor cycling to improper superheat adjustment, all of those things cause these, these smaller losses that add up to large amounts at the end of the day, even though your system may be running effectively and all of your temperatures are at set point, but doesn't mean it's running efficiently. That's for sure. Um, and this is just an example of a store, a million BTU store, where there's dirty condensers or old compressor room and, you know, pressure switches hanging off the side. Still, they're running effectively, just not efficiently. And well, I apologize, all the builds are off of this slide, but um, let me just explain what this slide is. It's, it's a lot to take in at one view, but um, the y-axis is energy efficiency and, and the x is time. And I've kind of drawn here where my red dot is, is kind of, we call it a technology development curve. You may have a system that's 15 or 20 years old, and it was at the peak of efficiency when it was installed, when it was designed back in the day. But through time and adjustments and maintenance, you can see that there's a deviation from optimum. So the energy efficiency has lost over time. And there's an opportunity there, and many of you do that from a retail, they'll recommission and optimize to a set that was very close to its original design intention. And a lot of stores do that. But there's also opportunities to add some capital upgrades to not bring it to today's standards, but bring it to a higher energy efficiency than even it was when it was originally developed and designed 20 years ago. And the key there is when you do that, and we'll talk about that, is not, it's not enough to just recommission and bring it up. It's the bigger question is, how do you hold those energy gains when you do upgrade? How do you make sure that you don't get continual degradation of energy over time. That's the important section here. So let me give you an example of a real example of a store that was involved in with an energy consultant doing some m and V uh, third party measuring. It was a 20 year old store, 45,000 square feet in Southwestern Ontario, medium temp, low temp, centralized rack, 164 horsepower with 10 semi-hematic compressors and all. The objective was to analyze the energy impact of the medium and low temp racks uh, of retrofitting, retrofitting each rack to one digital variable capacity compressor. That was the original intent. So step one, really important. When we take a look at the journey to energy excellence, kind of we've been using that term within Emerson and, and others is that we've kind of laid out about six steps. The first step to any energy project is to understanding your current state, baselining the energy so you know what to compare against. So that's what we did. This next step we're gonna do is step two, be recommissioning to factory specs. But so we did that. We added CTs. Um, either they're hardwired CTs with that Emerson has the modules for, or you can use third party. These are wireless CTs, which are super fast to set up a system. You just clip it around the wire. 
wirelessly send a signal to a modem, collect all the data, and have that done very quickly, very efficiently. So that's available today to speed the process. But you add those CTs to any of the, <clears throat> pardon me, any of the sources that you want to measure, even out separate condensing units if you've got it, you know, rooftop units, and the rest of your main refrigeration system if you're doing the entire facility. In this case, uh, for the example that I'm going to talk about, we just basically looked at the rack. And the important thing for us to do initially was to measure so we can build a weather normalized power profile of the existing system the way it was today without any modifications made to it. So that was important so that we can have a measured before and after. At every single temperature, you can predict what the actual power should be because as ambience increase, of course, Condensing temperatures increase, differentials across the compressors increase, loads on the store start to increase. So, you, so it's really important to look at it from a weather normalized perspective. So we wanted to do that for this store. So the retailer decided, hey, we've done step one. I know what my baseline is. Before we do any capital upgrades, I need to understand if I just recommission the existing 20-year-old store that I have today to my factory set points, what they should be. What does that look like and how much energy can I save? So that's what we did in step two. 20-year-old store, as I mentioned, a million BTUs, 163 horsepower. Um, the total kilowatts was 900,000 kilowatt hours total by medium temp, by low temp discus. So step B, install the energy monitoring. We use Climacheck system and the company we work with was Rent Technic. Uh, we found, we, we developed our, weather, our measured, our weather normalized energy profile. We adjusted all the set points, superheats, high and low pressure, compressor cut-ins, cut-out, made sure that the temperature sensors we had were the right temperature sensors. They didn't have offsets built into them that can throw us off, corrected that. The only money we spent on hardware was we spent three, 35, the retailer spent $3,500 on boards and relays to change it from a two fan cycling uh, at a time on the condenser to individual fan cycling so we can achieve a floating condensing down to 70 degree minimum saturated condensing. That's all they did. We used the energy monitoring equipment to measure and also provide continuous commissioning that we'll talk about in a minute. As soon as readings, <clears throat> the reason we did that is that we needed a system to say, as soon as my energy profile varies from outside of the norm that it should be, it sends an alarm to say, hey, you may be effectively cooling the way you'd like, but your energy profile is off. You need to check what's wrong. So. What do we do? What kind of savings did we get after just optimizing set points? It was measured at 162,000 kilowatt hours. They spent, <clears throat> their energy rates were average, were blended at 14 cents a kilowatt hour. So $22,680 were, were saved. The interesting thing about this retailer that was super uh, important to him is that, oh, let me back up is that he wanted us to measure and verify for eight months without doing anything else. How long can we hold those energy gains by just optimizing set points? So after eight months, we've proven to the retail we could hold the gains by energy recommissioning anytime something went out of whack. Okay, he said after eight months, let's do the next step. Let's look at refrigeration technology upgrades like digital. And specifically, digital upgrades is what he wanted. And what is digital? Digital is a Copeland uh, trademark. Um, Copeland digital technology is really, it's different from inverter-based modulation. When you take a variable speed compressor, you're, you're slowing down or you're speeding up that compressor to change its mass flow. A digital 
Copeland is basically you're loading and unloading the compressor. The compressor on the left is a 3D discus, three-cylinder discus. The one on the right is a Copeland scroll digital. But if you, if you take, if you understand pulse width modulation, if we use a 20-second period, and we need that compressor based on our suction pressure signal saying we need to unload that compressor by 50%, what happens is that compressor will run at full load, full mass flow for 10 seconds, and will run at zero mass flow, that individual compressor, for 10 seconds, and then we'll load up again. So it's 100% mass flow or 0% mass flow. That's how you vary the capacity based on a 20 second period or a 15 second period. The same with the scroll. So that's how digital works, 100% mass flow or zero. Now, what that does, when you have four or five of these compressors in parallel, and you have one compressor that can modulate mass flow in five or 10 second increments, that really tends to level the load out for all of the other compressors on that lineup. And it dramatically reduces compressor cycling and arcing and sticking of those contactors and single phasing of those motors. Uh, dramatically reduces that, increases obviously the contactor light, load matching I talked about, and improves suction set point. Now instead of having a 15 or a 20 horsepower compressor completely turning off and on at the same, you know, on and off, you have a, another compressor that's just modulating within five to 10 second increments. That's quite different than having it run until a pressure switch kicks it off. So you can really tighten up your suction pressures in doing so. And for every one pound increase in, in your suction pressure, you get about a 2% reduction in um, power on that compressor. So that's significant. And that's really important. Again, I apologize the builds, there's no builds on this slide, but uh, let's start with the top of this slide. The original, this is an actual screen print from a system that was retrofitted um, that had 72 pound swings in suction pressure. That's a tremendous amount of swings. And really what happens when your suction pressure runs high, it means that your saturated suction temperature is high then you run the risk of product degradation. When your suction pressure is really low, that means your compression ratio is higher, you're using more energy. And it keeps doing that. Well, on September the 8th, around noon, we activated the digital. You can see how tightly the suction pressure pulled down. And the reason it did that is because if you look down at the bottom, this dark line of the 2D and the dark tight lines of the 6D compressor, that, those were cycles. There were so many cycles that looked like a solid line. As soon as the digital was activated, and you can see this green line, 3D never shuts off. The, the digital never shuts off, it just modulates. The other compressors now barely turn on and off. It went from 900 cycles per day to 12 starts in four days. Tremendous reduction in cycling. Plus, they had an eight pound pressure increase, average suction pressure increase, which gave us just a calculated 16% power reduction. So that's, that's the power of, of, of balancing out your suction pressure and stabilizing. Because of that stabilization in pressure, that has an impact on the suction line, of course. It has an impact on all the suction lines. It has an impact on the EPRs on those lineups. It has an impact on the, on the equalizing line of the expansion at the end of the coil. All of that settles out, smooths out, and causes better, smoother uh, suction pressure control. So let's take a look at the actual results of doing this. So when we did the digital upgrade, we actually looked at the medium temp rack and not just take the lead compressor. We wanted to find out which of those five compressors on the medium temp rack is the weakest, is the poorest performing. So we've identified which one was running at the poorest efficiency 
and we changed that compressor to a digital. We did the same thing on the low temp rack. We identified the one running the hottest and the poorest, and we changed it. Step F is what I'm talking about. We ran those new compressors on the rack at full load for one month to compare it against the poor performing compressors that were on there. And it showed us a 4% savings at the end of one month, weather normalized, of course. And then we said, okay, we're satisfied with that because we've been able to hold those gains. Now we're going to enable the digital modulation. Now we also had an E2 um, controller on the rack and the Emerson E2 controller as an enhanced suction group feature was very easily integrates the digital control to with the, the rack controller for optimum performance. We enabled that. We saw a medium temp savings of 75,000 kilowatt hours and a low temp savings of 47,000 kilowatt hours for a percentage number of 12% in additional savings. So overall, we were looking at 16% in savings with the activation of the digital and with a blended rate of 14 cents a kilowatt hour, it's a $17,000 savings. That retailer also wanted to change the condenser. He wanted to move on to ECM fan motor, uh, condenser fan motors and also change the, the, the expansion valves in the cases to electronic valves. Unfortunately, we never got to that point. We got that store, got tagged as a complete retrofit, and they went uh, they changed the whole store over, but so we never got a chance to complete that. But this test did show by optimizing set points, $22,000 saving, by optimizing to digital, another $17,000 savings. So they were quite happy. This is the post, pre and post. So the low temperature rack, pre, you can see the average suction pressure was 30.6 30 PSIG. And then the post was raised to 31.4. So that was positive. And on the medium temp rack is where you have the most impact. Um, the pre was at 58 pounds and it went up to 68 pounds. So you can imagine with 68 pounds, a 10 pounds of higher average suction pressure, average now we're talking about, that's a tremendous amount of savings. Um, <clears throat> When you do the math here on the peak demand, it doesn't have that tremendous impact on peak demand, a 1.9 kilowatts on the low temp and, and three kilowatts on the low temp. But the kilowatt, the consumption is where the real impact was here of a 47,000 and uh, 75,000, as I mentioned earlier. From a total cost of ownership, not total cost of ownership, from a from a simple payback perspective, this whole job at the time was a $23,000 investment. The utilities paid half, eleven five. The net project cost was eleven five. The annual savings, that's just for the digital, was 17000 Simple payback with incentive, 0.7 years. Without incentive, 1.3 years. And this was all done by Rent Technic the third-party reporting company that provided the report to the uh, end user and to Emerson. Okay, I want to take this opportunity, take about 30 seconds to answer these polling questions. The only polling question that I have in the document, so I'll give you a few seconds to, uh, to answer that, if you will. That'd be great. So, step three, other refrigeration additions or upgrades that I wanted to talk about. Uh, step three, um, we talked about digital or variable speed on the compressor. Now, our distance compressors, I forgot to mention the note at the bottom, they are VFD compatible. If you add a drive to a di Copeland distance compressor, you can drive from, from 25 to 60 hertz of modulation. Uh, that store, we, we had talked about floating head, and it went down to a 70-degree uh, saturated condensing. In Title 24 in California, that's what it calls out, minimum 70 saturated condensing. One thing I did want to talk about is the unique uh, unique features of click and collect or the e-commerce um, 
picking up groceries at a retailer now has caused for, you know, a lot of the online ordering. There's people, obviously, that pick the groceries, store the groceries, and they have to store them somewhere refrigerated. And that somewhere refrigerated is either in these reach-in cases or these walk-in boxes. So higher volume retailers have these walk-in boxes that they've added to their facility. And uh, many of these walk-in boxes have been designed per normal walk-in box design loads. But as we're finding out, some of the volume in these walk-in boxes are tremendously high and the relative humidity and temperature within the space that those boxes are located can vary dramatically and bring in a lot of moisture into those spaces and air infiltration into those spaces that cause added load. So it's not enough to just select that box. There's other mitigating factors that need to be considered from a volume, humidity, and all of that stuff when we're talking about. We, so our Emerson engineers um, did some calculations here on a walk-in freezer, to give you an example, on the air infiltration load in just the freezer. The evaporator temperature for this example, we use minus six, freezer RH 65%, store ambient 75, store RH 55%. The size of the door, of course, has an impact. Um, also, we, we assumed they had curtains um, that were kept closed, which are about 92% efficient. So all that factored in. The typical door open time, about five seconds to pick one item, seven for two, and nine seconds to pick three items. And when you do all the math, and, and there's in the shelves, if the shelves inside that walk-in freezer are empty, at minus six walk-in freezer, there's 2,500 BTUs per accumulated minute of open time. Now, if you have 50% of your shelves are full or 100%, you've got thermal mass in there. So the amount of BTUs for air infiltration doesn't have as big of an impact. But it's interesting that for every minute, the minute every minute, you may say it doesn't seem like a lot, but when someone's going pulling two to 300 orders a day, and maybe they're going in and out of there four to 600 times a day, those are a lot of minutes where those doors are open and that extra air infiltration load needs to be considered when siding those boxes. So just kind of put that out there so that you don't have a unit running all the time and having uh, potential uh, product quality issues. So medium temp case upgrades, uh, obviously the next step is adding doors to some cases, especially medium temp cases on these older stores. Many retailers have started to do that, adding electronic valves to cases when they buy new, ECM motors on the evaporators. Those are all steps that obviously save a lot of energy, but sometimes adding doors to a medium temp rack starts to create a different set of of problems because now you've got a rack that was designed for cases with no doors. And when you add doors to the cases and, and those loads drop by 60% or more, then you've got overcapacity on the rack that you need to be able to deal with. And those are a different set of, of, of stresses that, uh, that need to be dealt with. Uh, example of one that we're involved in was more of a, a, uh, a pharmacy that had 36 feet of dairy open case. They had large temperature swings. The latent pain, they didn't really realize um, about shelf quality. I mean, the, the life, the shelf life, until they put doors on the cases and found out how much longer uh, the shelf life was. But we added 36, we did, contractor added 36 feet of dairy case of doors. We replaced that condenser unit with a 10 horse condenser unit replaced with a five horsepower digital scroll. So now you've got a five horsepower digital scroll on a, with a 10 horsepower unit with a condenser, an oversized condenser, digital scroll with a digital controller on there. Um, it found that we measured and verified 60% reduction in energy. They received utility rebates, but 
besides all that, they found the temperature, of course, to be much tighter because of the doors, improved product quality, increased shelf life. And also something else that was commented on dwell time, people standing in front looking at what to buy uh, was increased and the contractor benefited from uh, future jobs. But oh, that was kind of an interesting one. Adding energy flexibility is, is, is something that we're hearing more and more about in retailers. And I showed this chart a little earlier on is from um, in that it's all about how do I get rid of this top gray section of peak demand in the middle of the day when the rates are the highest and the days are the warmest. And, and retailers, not just retailers, but also uh, commercial users are looking at cold thermal energy storage as a way of doing that, in that you're shifting. Instead of using your high refrigeration during the time of day that costs the most, let's use the refrigeration. We're using more kilowatt hours, but at the time of day when the rates are the lowest, to chill a thermal bath, either it's uh, an ice slurry or some other a PCM material, face change material that we can chill during off-peak hours and discharge it during the peak hours so that we don't have to turn on compressors. And that's what these two on the left are all about, is you're charging a, a, an ice-type solution or a face change material solution during off-peak, and you're using that cold energy during the peak period so you don't have to turn on a refrigeration compressor, whether that's uh, this one or these, this particular Viking coal scenario. Rebound technology is more of a chemical mixture that provides uh, a very cold subcooled liquid for large industrial installations to gain more enthalpy in your liquid so you can be more energy efficient and have quicker pull downs uh, when you need it, even though the energy rates are the highest. So these are the three different types of strategies that are being investigated in order, again, to try to add some energy flexibility in your facility. And then the last thing here, I'm not really going to cover it uh, in, in the interest of time, but obviously rooftop unit upgrades, demand control ventilation, so you're not bringing in too much air for no reason have to overheat the air or overcool the air in the winter. Um, and I, I've kind of placed it, I used to have it in step four, but in talking to uh, industry experts to say, you know, it makes a whole lot more sense to move it to step five if you're adding doors to your medium temp uh, cases, then you're changing the indoor environment. And once you change that indoor environment, then you can look at your RTU upgrades and make sure that they're effectively sized uh, in order to match those different load characteristics. So that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and the last thing really before we get to, to some questions is condition-based energy maintenance. Um, you know, as you go through any, any or all of these energy retrofit opportunities, that whole journey in energy excellence is that, as I had mentioned in this, these, this example here, is that once you've saved those, the energy, you're able to reduce it, not only make it effective, your system effective, but make your system efficient. How do you assure that you're always operating optimally from an energy perspective? So you need the tools to be able to continuously measure the weather normalized energy against this profile. And as the energy profile goes out of whack, you get an alarm to say, hey, that condenser's out, the compressor's off, or the cases are out, whatever it happens to be, to keep you in line. And that's really the important part of having condition-based maintenance and the right enterprise service and system to be able to identify that notify you where the issue is and how to take corrective action. That's a, that's a key component to making sure that you have, uh, you can maintain sustainable energy savings. But when you look at the overall upgrade of, of a supermarket in recap, we talked about 
a lot of DX systems infrastructure, and that's the oldest infrastructure. There's a lot of new CO2 DX going in and so on, but the older infrastructure needing to convert from R22 or 404A into lower GWP type uh, refrigerant options. There's an opportunity there to look at not just the refrigerant retrofit change and what goes with it, but how can you energy optimize um, your stores and try to add some energy flexibility as you start getting more and more uh, distributed energy resources within your sector. It gives you protection and being able to flux energy a little more readily um, to, to allow some, uh, some leeway. It's leveraging the IoT infrastructure you have in the store. It's working with, with manufacturers such as Emerson to try to optimize control um, so that you can have a, a longer range sustainability financially and uh, environmentally. So opportunities for energy efficiency are real. Uh, therefore, savings are available. While each store is more complex, real-time data-driven energy programs, and, and that's really what NREL, what DOE, what you read some, some research papers around, around the world, there's a lot of work happening around the retail space in retail, in, in real-time energy, because renewables are starting to stress the grid. Um, and impacting stability, so, we, we, so we, we need to look at that from our end. And transforming energy-intensive supermarkets into flexible assets I talked about is, uh, is within the reach. So I'm going to stop here and, and see if there's any questions. I, I went through that fairly quickly, and I apologize if I did, but I wanted to make sure I got uh, through all the, the program. One thing's for sure, there's no way that I've covered every single aspect of energy savings. I understand that. I wanted to give you an overall view of it with a little more focus on the digital retrofit case study that uh, we've gone through. So I'll leave it open okay. for questions. I have John Wallace of Emerson also on the line that can field some questions from a, a controls perspective or, or anything else for that matter. Yeah. And as a reminder, to participate in the Q&A session, uh, please type your question into the uh, text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default as all panelists. Uh, Andre, we got one question here. Um, it says, for the digital retrofit you spoke of, do you have to change the whole compressor or can you just change the head and the valve plate? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you have the option. And uh, if your compressor is less than four years old, your, your distance compressor is, is less than four years old and it's in good working order, you don't have to change the whole compressor. You can just change the head. Uh, we have a digital retrofit kit um, that you can do that with the 3D and the 4D and 6D. You don't have to change the whole compressor if it's less than four years old. If it's older than four years old, then the recommendation is to change the whole compressor. Okay, great. Uh, this next question that came in, it says, what does digital modulation really mean? Maybe I missed it while you were speaking. Yeah, so, so digital, really refer to digital as on and off, zero and one. And so if you think of it that way, zero and one from digital perspective is that um, when it's operating, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, it's operating at 100% full flow um, as it's designed to. And when it goes to unload, there is a controller that, that looks at suction pressure set point versus where you are in that period of the next anticipated within the next 20 seconds. And then the controller will decide, okay, it looks like we need to cut to 50% loading over the next 20 seconds. So you're basically going to run the compressor at 100% full load for 10 seconds and zero mass flow for the next 10 seconds. Now, the compressor doesn't shut off. 
the motor is still turning at a 1750 RPM, but it's just not pumping. And then the next 10 seconds, boom, it starts pumping again. Great. I hope that clarifies yeah. it. Um, the next question is, if adding doors to medium temp cases reduces the load by up to 60%, does this have a negative impact on a system that was designed for a higher design load? Well, it can have a, a, um, an effect on the load of the rack because now you've got, you've got compressors that were originally selected for that maximum load on the hottest anticipated day. And all of a sudden, um, if you add doors to all your medium temps and that rack capacity goes down to 50%, you don't have the same modulation, um, the ability to modulate properly when it, with only 50% of your rack than you had designed for for a full 100% of your rack. So, so it causes a different set of stresses that retailers need to be able to deal with. Again, try to smooth out that suction manifold pressure not to have excessive compressor cyclings. Okay, we have another question here. It says, are digital compressors a better approach than VFDs? That's a great question. Um, digital compressors, the advantage of a, it, well, they're both variable capacity modulation. So, so let, let's make sure that we both understand that. They're both doing the same thing in trying to make up the intermediate load so that another compressor sitting next to it in parallel doesn't come on and off for no reason. So they're both doing the same thing. Um, that's one thing. The, the, the advantage, if I, if I could say that, of digital versus a variable speed is just that it's simpler to apply because it's basically the same compressor that unloads the head. There's a small little digital control. You don't have to be a, you don't have to know anything about drives in order to apply digital. If you're very comfortable with drives, then it's no big deal to add a drive to a compressor that's capable of accepting a drive. Then you'll get the same benefit out of either. Okay, great. Um, the next question here is, what is the difference between a set point management service and an energy um, analytics? I'll let John handle that. He's closer to, to that part of the world than I am. Sure. Thank you, Robert. Robert, please. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah, so um, a set point management service really is, is um, you, you sort of hit upon it in your, one of your early charts there where you talked about kind of um, reviewing each of the settings for the refrigeration system, the set points, that'd be the suction pressures, the defrost schedules, maybe any of the pertinent uh, settings, especially those that affect the energy consumption. Um, pulling those back or remotely gathering those settings and then um, periodically reviewing those settings to make sure that they are kept at the optimized um, uh, levels. Um, I liked your curve you showed early on where you showed, you know, you can optimize everything and have it running perfectly, but then over time you get some natural erosion. Maybe it's um, uh, technicians are, are maybe changing some of the set points and things like that. So a set point management service is really all about trying to keep that optimum or golden set of set points uh, throughout the life of the system itself. And different ways to do it, um, there's services that sort of automate that process for you. Um, now, I think the other part of that question may have been about energy analytics. So, so the, the set points are dealing with the actual settings within the, um, uh, the controllers themselves, and the energy analytics are really using the, the result, the energy consumption or, or um, um, uh, the, the KWKWH um, and running analytics on those values to try to, to draw a little bit deeper insight as you showed in some of your slides there. So that's the main difference between those, those two types of, um, of services. Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. Um, the next question I have here is, are digital compressors usually used as the first in line on a parallel rack? Uh, 
They they don't need to be um, in that particular job that I, I talked about. Um, we didn't really care where it really sat on the rack because we wanted to identify for maximum energy benefit the weakest compressor, you know, the poorest performing compressor on that lineup. Um, and to be honest, I don't remember where it was located on the rack, but it doesn't need to be the first in line. It does not need to be the first in line. But, but meaning uh, physically, when it's running, it's always on. So it's the one that never shuts off because it's always making up the difference, small differences in capacity uh, to the other compressors. So, so it never shuts off. It's the others that are able to cycle on and off when they get to that point where the digital can't go beyond its, its capacity limitation. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think the last question that I have here is, is there currently a control system that can monitor the performance of a system and determine if it is running efficiently against the expected performance and notify you when it is not? Did you want to handle that one, John, as well? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I, I think um, there's different ways to configure a control system. Um, to provide uh, that type of, of information. Uh, I would say the, the, the ones that I'm, I'm aware of, uh, there are a lot about alarming and those kind of things, but you can also set up, say, some customized logic to look at other areas um, of the performance and then uh, notify based upon that. that. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, different control systems have different levels of flexibility, but if there's some unique items that you're looking to uh, to add into it, generally they support that. Um, some of the more interesting things too are things like where you, you, you sort of treat the control system and you're, you mentioned the Connect Plus as a, as a, a system together and uh, kind, of, kind of use that as your notification engine for any kind of performance problems and those kind of things. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you so much for your participation. As a reminder, a few days after this live event, you can access this presentation on demand at climate.emerson.com slash E360 webinars, and you'll also receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recorded event. On behalf of Emerson, thank you for attending today's E360 webinar. Information and registration will be available soon for our upcoming webinar. We hope you can join us again. Thank you.